Today on No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. Maybe from here through the rest of the book of Genesis, that we will learn that all of this preparatory stuff was nothing more than God preparing his life for the ultimate calling that he had upon his life. He was bringing him in and through that. And I want you to remember this in your life, that no matter where you find yourself, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you've been in the church for a long time or not very long, that because God is not done with you yet, how do we know that's true? Because you're still here, because you're still breathing, because you're still upon the face of the earth. I, I, I don't want you to back off of recognizing that God is still growing you and moving you towards that plans and the purposes that he has for you. And they do bring forth growth in your life. And when growth happens, there's opposition. But people's lives are changed because of you because of what God is up to in your life. I want you to remember that. Welcome to No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer. Our study in Genesis picks up today with the story of Joseph. Throughout his life, we see a man who endured great difficulty and pain, even though he had a heart to follow and obey God. Whether it was being rejected by his brothers because of envy and jealousy, and having his family torn apart when they sold him into slavery, or being falsely accused by his boss's wife and getting thrown into prison because of it, Joseph always had the encouraging reminder that God was with him. Even in the midst of darkness and the depths of despair, he always trusted in the sovereign hand of God, knowing his love would never fail. At the end of his life, Joseph could confidently make the bold declaration to those who hurt him, you intended to hurt me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. And now, here's Pastor Jeff as we continue our study through Genesis. Uh, the framework of what happens within the church, uh, let's just go church building, the fellowship here, right? There's a, there's a stewardship that is here. And um, I, would, uh, I, would, I would love to, um, uh, let's see, Proverbs says, let the, the, let the mouth of another man praise you and not your own. But I would love to, I'd love to praise you. I'd love to commend you. I, I would even like to say uh, thank you for being faithful and diligent. Listen, you know, some two months ago, uh, we launched into this place of uh, refurbishing this place because everything had become so worn. I mean, there's hundreds of people that go through this place on a weekly basis and everything. Um, and, and many of you guys stepped up to the plate and you made it possible that, that everything could change and be refurbished here. And, and so good job on being a faithful uh, steward, your stewardship over contributing and making sure that the work around here, that, that, that this fellowship is up to speed so that it continues to remain a place where we can come in here, fellowship, we can be taught the Bible, we can worship our God, and we can, we can, you know, leave the doors open, if you will, to the community because people come in here and they're fed and they're encouraged and all that stuff. And so uh, Joseph, he was made an overseer of this. And for you and I, we're overseers. We are stewards over what God has put into our hands. Take a look at the screen here. First Corinthians chapter four, verse two, a very, very, very uh, familiar verse. I'll give it to you out of the NAT Bible. And it says this, uh, what is sought in stewards? is that one be found faithful. And so may we never back off. May we understand that hard times will come and go. As we're seeing within Joseph's life, for 13 years, he's back and forth in the middle of these hard times, but he never let that stewardship, that faithfulness, he, he, he never took for granted the oversight, you know, being an overseer there of what was placed into his hands as a household steward there. He was faithful, faithful in that. And may, may God stir within your heart the same thing. Now, what we, what we learn, uh, I guess, in a chapter or two, or maybe from here through the rest of the book of Genesis, that we will learn that all of this preparatory stuff was nothing more than God preparing his life for the ultimate calling that he had upon his life. He was bringing him in and through that. And I want you to remember this in your life, that no matter where you find yourself, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you've been in the church for a long time or not very long, that because God is not done with you yet, how do we know that's true? Because you're still here, because you're still breathing, because you're still upon the face of the earth. I, I, I don't want you to back off of recognizing 
that God is still growing you and moving you towards that plans and the purposes that he has for you. And they do bring forth growth in your life. And when growth happens, there's opposition. But people's lives are changed because of you, because of what God is up to in your life. I want you to remember that. And this is the same thing with Joseph. He was being prepared for his life call. But the testing and the bad circumstances, what did they do? Well, they had, a, they had a very special work in his life as well as ours. But his bad circumstances that forged into his soul an unrelenting faithfulness. And I think sometimes that we could miss that as Christians. I know we read the New Testament verses about what Paul has to say, uh, you know, about hard times and trials and difficulties and all of that stuff. And we read his experiences. But it seems like when I turn back into the Old Testament and I see that in these you know, in the patriarchs here, as we're going down that vein right now, is I see within their life, not only the promise that God gave to Abraham, but, but the adversity in which they went through along the way, that sometimes it's, it's, it's easier to view it through like, like the distant foggy past right here, as opposed to some of the New Testament stuff. It inspires a greater faith because I have the, it's like I have the totality of that story put together of like, okay, God had a plan in his life. He was, he was called, he was given a vision and a dream and then difficulty and then bam, I see the completion of that full work. And you and I, we don't see the completion of the full work within our life. Some of you are, are, are in this place, uh, and, 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 and let me do this. Bear with me here for a moment. Okay, can I ask who is in this room, if you're 40 years old or younger, raise your hand for me. Is there anybody here that qualifies to that? Okay, now I'm not gonna ask the rest of you guys your age. You can put your hands down, okay? <laughs> I'm tempted. <laughs> no, okay. Okay, okay. Uh, for, for, for those 10 of you that raised your hand, okay, please, please realize this, please recognize this. Man, I didn't even get called into this work until I was 40 years old. I didn't come into pastoring until I was 40 years old. Then all the things that God was, I, I, was a, I was a Christian man, right? I got saved when I was 21 years old. But what God was doing within my life and, and, and all of those, uh, the different uh, professions that I had, uh, it was really two primary professions. It was law enforcement as, as, as really the primary anchor one. And then in the, in the second one, I don't, and I don't talk about this one much uh, because I joined Jody uh, in real estate, right? She had 25, 30 years in, in, in uh, right, just shy of 30 years in real estate. Um, but, I, but I joined her in that aspect. And, and man, we went through redevelopment of downtown San Diego and, and we were in the middle of all that stuff a number of decades back, you know, 20, 25 years back and all that stuff. And, and it was just... Um, it was just such a, 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 you know, a time of learning. I didn't, I didn't know how God was going to work all those things out. And I want you to be encouraged here that we can just take from Joseph's life and that we can recognize that whether I'm still being um, prepared through the day-to-day -day jobs that I have or whether I'm in a place of retirement having passed by my professional career, that God is still molding you and shaping you and using you in powerful ways. So don't let that slip by is to think that you don't, you're not adding any value to the body of Christ. Oh, you are. You are because there's breath in your lungs and because God is your God. That's why. Now, let's, 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 uh, let's switch the topic for just a second here, okay? Let, let's, let's, let's move it around for a second. Let, let, let me ask you this question. Uh, have, have, have in your Christian walk, have you ever come to that place where you've asked God, God, I just wish that you would grow me in this area. Have, have you ever prayed a prayer like that? Raise your hand so I know. So, okay, a number of you have. Okay, good. Well, I often make that request within my life. I, I have found over the years that uh, I ask the Lord, God, help me. I, I, you know, and, and, and it seems like, uh, you know, in more recent decades, it, it, it's, just, it's just a continual prayer. God, I, I just pray that you would give me more wisdom to lead. I pray, God, that you would infuse into my heart more faithfulness to carry out the mission uh, that you've called me to, the mission that you've given to me personally and, 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 and even in the body of Christ. In a more recent weeks, maybe even a few months, I've been asking that God would give to me more endurance not to give up. <laughs> those are great prayers, by the way. It's like, yeah, ask God for those things. But you know the crazy thing? Is I'm asking God for growth, and I'm asking him for these particular things. But it seems like the more that I ask for those things, what happens is I routinely find myself enveloped in struggles. And we don't like to talk about that side. We love to talk about the answered prayers. Well, the answered prayers are coming through the hardship. That, that the shaping that God is doing of us as people 
both in our heart, in our, in, in our, in our soul and our spirit, and in the transformation of our mind, it requires that and many times it requires for the sparks to fly and the grinding to happen and the rough edges to be chiseled off and all of those things, that God does that. And he grants us, he grants us these things. Listen, he, he's invited us. Jesus tells us this, Matthew chapter seven, that, you know, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, you know, that, uh, you know, the, 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 the Greek imperative there in, in the sense of just, yes, keep going, keep doing it. So don't stop praying for God to enlarge the borders of your heart and to grow you and all this stuff. And, 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 and honestly, I think that that is a healthy part of Christianity is that we would not forget to ask God to grow us in our faith and, 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 and not to be afraid of the crazy struggles. Listen, your struggle and my struggle are different than Joseph's struggles. And each of us have different struggles you know, uh, together. You know, I, I just happen to stand as a mouthpiece. And so gr- God grinds on me a little bit more, if that makes sense, uh, because there's a lot to work out in, in a, uh, well, a sinner like me, but I guess there's a lot to work out in sinners like you too. <laughs> uh, but with, with all of those things happening, I want us to consider the word of God. I, I, I want us to see that, that as God is answering my prayers, as God is answering your prayers, I want us to understand in, in, in maybe just a simple, simple little snapshot here of, of kind of what that looks like within our lives. So we're gonna take a little detour here just for a second, okay? The first one is this, is Romans 5 and 3. We'll see it on the screen here, okay? Uh, let, let, let's, let's, let's look at it together here. We can rejoice too when we run into problems. You ever ran into problems? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. And trials, okay. And, and so, so let us, let's just understand this right here. For when those things happen, the problems of trials, for we know, there's a certainty there, that they help us develop what? Endurance. endurance. So the very first one that we can put down, endurance or perseverance. But as God is answering my prayers, as he's doing these things, and there's the hardships that come, but, but he's forging within me something. Now, the perseverance or that endurance, it moves us on to something else. Let's take a look at James 1 and 4 now. Here's what James 1 and 4 says. He says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Now, it's easy to go by this and go, okay, I'm not quite sure which one I'm supposed to pick here, but I would point you to mature, okay? And and so we see this perseverance or this endurance. It brings us to a place of maturity, understanding that God has a purpose, that, that when we're in that place of asking God for something and, and he puts us through these things that he elongates the endurance, that he elongates the perseverance, that he's taking us to a place of, of maturity. Now, now, the last one is this. I love the last one here because it's almost like it, it puts a finish line, it puts a hope on it. And so in James 1 and 12, it says this. It says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. And this is what we're gonna see in a moment with uh, uh, Joseph. Uh, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So, so if you can just recognize the middle, uh, the middle sentence in here, that, 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 that coming through all of this stuff, that there's a reward there. Receive the crown of life, man. The crown of life. We don't know exactly what that looks like just yet. But we do know this. We do know that, that as God is working things out within our life, and he's, he's, he's developing that enlarging of the borders of our heart, if you will. And as we're going forward and we're coming to maturity in the faith and all of this, this, this sense, because we're, we're exercising ourselves and we're looking to the Lord and God is doing that. There's a reward that is attached to this. So let us not pass by, let us not pass through, I should say, the trials is to think that they don't have a reason. So, so we understand that there's a reward that is happening that will take place. Well, Jeff, it's been a great study so far, but I've heard that there's something special happening in the fall this year. Can you tell our listeners a little more about what's going on? Yeah, for sure. Uh, We're doing the fall marriage retreat again uh, this year in Breckenridge, and it's going to be really special. Uh, My wife, Jody and I, we just celebrated 32 years of marriage, and we've always enjoyed discipling married couples. Uh, But this year, we were hit with some tough times. You know, that word cancer became a reality for us. Uh, my wife literally had a softball-sized tumor removed from her body. And so after all of the surgeries and the treatments that we went through earlier this year, we were just unsure that we would actually be able to do the marriage retreat again. Uh, but the Lord ministered to us one morning and gave us the theme for the retreat. It's, it's keeping marriages together when everything is pulling us apart. Wow. And what I thought would, would hinder us from hosting this year's marriage retreat, all the trials, is actually the catalyst for this year's retreat. 
God wants to bring fresh hope for those struggling and celebration for others. Wow, that's really powerful. And it's exciting to see how God is really ministering to you through those difficult times. So can you tell us a little bit more about the retreat details? Sure. Uh, The details are uh, October 18th through the 20th. That's a Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, It's in Breckenridge, uh, Colorado. And, and here's the best part. You know, the cost per couple for this whole entire weekend, it's only $450. That's an incredible price. Uh, it includes a conference. It includes a mission. It, in full, it includes uh, two full breakfasts here, uh, Saturday morning, Sunday morning. It takes care of all your, your lodging, uh, a, a couple's gift bag, basket, and parking. And so we hope that you guys can join us for the 2024 Calvary Marriage Retreat. Very cool. Very cool. Well, I'm grateful for the ministry God has allowed us to take part in. Uh, It seems like there's such a great need for marriage discipleship in our culture these days. Those details, again, are October 18th through the 20th in Breckenridge, Colorado. Cost is $450 per couple, everything included. Spots are limited and expected to fill fast. And so if you would like more information, feel free to text us the word retreat to 720 three, five, four, six, four, eight, five. Again, that's R E T R E A T to seven, two, zero, three, five, four, six, four, eight, five. Now we come into the second thing and that is temptation. Follow along. I'm going to switch back to the NLT to read verses seven through 10. Here's what it says in the NLT. It says, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him. This is Joseph. She began to soon look at him lustfully. Remember, he was a handsome and a well-built young man. And here's what she said. She said, come and sleep with me. She demanded it. But Joseph refused. He said, look, he told her, my my master trusts me with everything in his entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has held back nothing from me except you because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. He placed that sin rightly against God. But she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day. And but he refused to sleep with her. And he kept out of her way as much as possible. We'll stop right there. And so understanding here that as we begin to look on this area of temptation... Again, don't miss what these verses are telling us about Joseph. Dude, he's an, he's an attractive young man in his late 20s. So I don't know what that means, if he's a tall, dark, handsome, and lean. I don't, I don't know. Uh, but, but I know that, that so much so that his boss's wife is throwing herself at him. Now, I want to give us some, some practical stuff here. It's not in the notes, so if you're following along on the notes that are online, uh, you're going to miss this. But will you take your Bible and turn to your right? Go to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 5, for just a moment. This is a little addition here. In Proverbs chapter 5, I'll be reading out a New King James on this. Um, and uh, again, directional-wise, if you were to just kind of half open your Bible... Psalm 118 is about the, roughly the middle of your Bible. Just turn to your right, just a few. And, the, and there you find the book of Proverbs. Look on your neighbor if you can't find it. And once you get there, Proverbs chapter five, don't read ahead. Some of you are reading ahead. You're spoiling the, all right. Just look up at me so I know you're there. You're going, what is he taking us, you know? All right. Uh, so, so scroll down to verse number three now, okay? It says, for the lips, the speech of an immoral woman drip honey and her mouth is smoother than oil. Flattery. Whether you're a man or a woman, please understand, you know, why Solomon is giving the uh, personification of this, uh, you know, the personification of wisdom is called out as a woman in the book of Proverbs. Here he's giving the, the young men that he's training within his courts, he's giving them wisdom for life. And, and, and he's tra- Solomon is trying to direct them into the right steps. And he's speaking to them about temptation to sexual sin. He speaks to them. He said, listen, this, this area of flattery, this speech, the lips of an immoral woman, woman that they drip honey. This, this is something that is, is it's seductive, it's drawing, and the taste that is upon it there, it's, a, it's an alluring thing. He tells him in verse number four, he says, listen, don't get off track. Because in the end, she's as bitter as wormwood. And this is, speaks of the calamity and the sorrow that follows in sexual immorality. He moves on down. Verses seven through 14, we find 
that in these things, in this area right here, that there's, there is the consequences to sexual sin that are spelled out. In, 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 in verse number eight, he says, remove your way far from her and do not go near the door of her house. So he says, don't toy with her. Don't flirt with her. Don't go down this direction. Why? Well, verse nine, lest you give your honor, your dignity to others and your years, this is the seasons of your life, to the cruel one. He says, lest aliens be filled with your wealth. That is your strength and your ability. He says, don't do it. And he goes on down and, 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 he, and he says, and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. Uh, this is, again, the, the aspect of, um, uh, of like a painful toiling is what this is talking about. And verse 11, and you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed. Um, hate to say this, but this is what the text actually says in the Hebrew. It speaks specifically of the man's genitalia and something happening there. So maybe today we would call that an STD. I'm not sure, but that's what that's all about. Uh, and he does give some, some, some remedy here, though. If you, if you uh, want to see the right use of sex, he gives that to us in verses 15 down through 20. Uh, and I love this. And, and I'm just a man, so I'm a simple guy. Uh, but I, I teach the Song of Solomon here in a very flavorful way on Wednesday nights. It is absolutely a mature adult setting in here when we do that. But he says here in these few verses, he says, drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Should your fountain be dispersed abroad? Should your source of satisfaction just, just go anywhere? He says, streams of water in the street. He says, let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Uh, now he gives us a euphemism here. He says, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. I'll let you pour your mind into that. As a loving deer and as, as a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. Always be intoxicated with her lovemaking would be a literal translation. He says, for, for why should you, my son, be enraptured by an in, immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? And so uh, we're people, and whether you're a man or woman, this is geared towards speaking to men about women, but you can take this and flip that, the examples on the head. And so whether you're married, single, divorced, uh, single by choice, or single not by choice, or, or, or widowed, whatever, please understand that this, this is a, a, Proverbs chapter five is one of those chapters that has a very pointed uh, spirit on that, and we can learn a lot from that. Now, as we flip back to our left, we go back to Genesis 39 here, we find in the middle of this, we understand what is going on here with Joseph. And here's what we don't pick up, or here's what we perhaps, uh, we, we, we don't always talk about in this. And that is, is that Potiphar, okay, this is, uh, who is Potiphar? This is Joseph's boss back here in Genesis 39. Um, and, and, and Potiphar, that he, wa he was one of Pharaoh's top officers, Okay, now in those particular days, what would take place, what would happen is, is that the kings would require, watch, their top officials to become eunuchs or to be eunuchs or to become eunuchs. Now, there was a specific application over that in, in many instances. And that was is that, that it primarily held to those that were over the, uh, you know, that were, that were guarding over the royal harem, okay? But a top, top official was also required to be or to become a eunuch. Very interesting, because we don't see this happening with Joseph as we go farther. And, and, and in fact, if this is the case, if this is the case of what happened with Potiphar, right, it, it doesn't say that he was uh, always that way, but as he rose to the ranks, as he came to that particular spot, if he became a eunuch, if that actually happened, he was castrated, okay, then you could potentially have a wife that was starved for love and sexual affection because her husband gave himself, watch it, don't miss it, because her husband gave herself entire, himself entirely to work. That's all for today. Join us for our next broadcast of No Greater Love with Pastor Jeff Kramer, weekdays at 1030 a.m. No Greater Love is an outreach ministry of Westminster Calvary and is supported by listeners like you. If you would like to partner with us, please text any dollar amount to 84321. We would like to personally invite you to join us for our weekly worship services Sundays at 8 or 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. We are located in Westminster, Colorado on the northeast corner of Church Ranch and Wadsworth Parkway near the Vasa Fitness. 
If you're not local, tune into the weekly live stream on our web campus, app, Roku, or on Apple TV. Have you downloaded the free Westminster Calvary app yet? You can stay up to date on coming events, join a small group, request prayer, and watch live worship services. Just search Westminster Calvary on your favorite app store today. Lastly, we're a church that's ready to serve you. If we can do so, give us a call at 303-223-4640. And remember, there's no greater love than when Jesus gave up his life for you and me. Thanks and God bless. Taking the cross.